fucking show up. I, I wouldn't be ashamed of that if I were you. <laughs> yeah, but it's, you don't want to look like it. Right. Besides, with this is messier than I usually am. So, <clears throat> what, what I'd like you to do, this is not a real interview. I'm not going to do questions and answers. I'm just going to cue you and you're going to okay. you're going to talk because you can do that in a professional put some sound bites, you introduce yourself and say that you were district attorney in San Francisco during this crucial period of time. And, well, tell us what was it like prosecuting a lot of cases. Um, start. <clears throat> prosecuting which type of cases? There are a lot of cases. Okay, so th is this interview specifically about yes. mer medical marijuana? Yes, right? we're doing a documentary on medical marijuana law in California. We have talked to doctors, lawyers, patients, providers, We've tried to talk to law enforcement and they give us the brush off. Huh. So I'm not sure how we're going to go about huh. giving a balanced case here. Right? Because I, they're pretty good in San Francisco, let me tell I you. Talk, I called the DEA, I called the federal attorney, I called the FBI, and I called the SFPD. The, the, SFPD, Fed, the feds won't help you at all. The SFPD had the decency to tell me they wouldn't participate. And oh. I talked to them several times. Everybody else came to the bureaucrat shuffle, oh. so I just don't know. What so who are you doing the interview on behalf of? <coughs> We're, we are an independent film company that evolved out of any media. Why did the police not want to participate? I have no idea. I mean, no, now, it could be. You, it could be. They ran my yellow sheet and found a 30-year-old pop bust. No. Oh. No, you, you, I mean, if you did it on the grounds that you're trying to be, do an objective thing on it. And... Sir, is it possible to turn off this way? Yeah, sure. It's right over there. You put it in the middle, it turns it off. Nice. We, we do want to be balanced. And, and you're, you're, the, you're the closest thing to law enforcement that has been willing to talk to us. Yeah. The district attorney, that's, that's law enforcement. Chief law enforcement. Chief law enforcement. And so, <clears throat> in order for us to get a, a, an objective view, of this craziness that right. medical marijuana has created in the legal landscape here. Which is great <laughs> opening in this ridiculous prohibition. I'm for that. Okay, tell us about that. Well, actually, you know, I, uh, I guess my in, 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 in a lot of ways, I attribute San Francisco's medical marijuana acceptance to Dennis Perron and myself. And actually began back in, it was 93 when Dennis put his proposition on the ballot, uh, which passed, and then uh, it was a policy uh, initiative that he put on, which doesn't create law, but under our charter is supposed to be followed up by the supervisors taking action on it. So after it passed, he phoned me up. I was on the Board of Supervisors at that time. And it told me what he wanted and uh, that he wanted me to carry some legislation to do something about his his proposition that it passed by 80%. Um, so I, I agreed, I'd be glad to take a look at it and see. I mean, I know marijuana, not a simple uh, get high drug at all. I had once tried a case where I represented somebody on the grounds that it was an essential part of their sincere religious belief. And by the time it was through, I certainly had no question that for that person, it was a sincere part of his religious practices. And, and I do know it is complex. And so we, dis we uh, how you do something on the Board of Supervisors, you interest, you, in you go ahead and you file your um, proposal, and then it's set for a hearing, and after the hearing, then you come up with legislation based on it. So the, the hearing was put together really by Dennis more than anybody else. And uh, 
he we came up with a uh, a, uh, a crew that was absolutely astounding. I mean, he had three of the ten people still serving, receiving legal medical marijuana. Uh, the hemophiliacs who contributed, who had contacted it during or contracted it during a blood transfusion. He, we had a police commissioner who was undergoing uh, cancer chemotherapy describe how she couldn't do anything with take a uh, drag on a marijuana cigarette and, and be fine. And we had a person after person, by the time I was through, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And actually the chief of police and I ran over in the corner and wrote the legislation, making it very lowest priority for law enforcement in San Francisco, which justified a police officer when he was convinced this was medical marijuana to walk away from it. Following that, then, I became elected district attorney. Uh, Proposition 215 uh, was proposed. I, not surprisingly, if you know the rest of them, ended up being the only district attorney in California who supported Proposition 215, uh, which passed. After it passed, uh, oh, come on, uh, the guy who was the AG before Lockyer, uh, the Republican Tom Lundgren from no. Long Beach. Not Dan Lundgren. Lundgren, Lundgren. Lundgren. yeah. Yes, Lundgren called a, a, what they call an all-zone conference in Sacramento of DAs and chiefs of police to determine how we could foil Proposition 215, which I went to, and uh, very interesting in that, you know, he, his position was, hey, we're going to just fight it, make them come up with the with the doctors, if they say they got a doctor's recommendation and they can't come up with the doctor's name, arrest them for f filing a false police report, you know, like this total get tough policy. And finally, at one point, somebody said, one of these DAs said, look, uh, or I guess it was the chief of police, said, Super, you know, DA Hallinan ha has supported this. How do you do that? How do you justify that? And, and, but it was like a sincere question, in my opinion. So they invited me up on the platform to address it. As I went, as I started walking up, a Lundgren's guy cut me off and said I couldn't couldn't get up on the platform. So I just started speaking from the floor, and then they invited me up on the platform anyway. And uh, and I told all the DAs, look, this is a real simple issue. It's a health issue. The voters have made it clear. Turn it over to your health departments. Let them take over control and supervision of this and treat it that way. Uh, you know, it didn't get a real, real enthusiastic reception, but it, I know it did give some people some food for thought. And then, of course, eventually, now most of the district attorneys have come to accept it and treat it the way I recommended that they did. When you, when you were district attorney here, what orders did you give? What you know? How did you handle these cases? Because not all of them are medical cases. How did you draw the line? And what you know? You know. Talk about your own experience here. Well, you know. I mean, some are not medical cases in a uh, fiscal sense. I mean, somebody dealing lots of drugs for just money in themselves. But my experience is most people who've been using marijuana for a long time have some medical reason, basis for doing it. And of course, Proposition 215 is so broad that, uh, that it really covers just about any kind of reason you would want to smoke marijuana other than purely wanting to smoke marijuana or make money at it or something. If you've got any kind of psychological or, or uh, medical reasons for it, and as I say, I do believe somebody who's been using it a long time has some medical reason for it. So when I came in in San Francisco and once 215, I, I had always followed a policy of, of feeling that 
that marijuana shouldn't be in with drugs, that drugs shouldn't be in with robbers and burglars. And, and, uh, and so I've tried to develop those distinctions. Once 215 passed, then I, we had clubs already. Dennis had used that model, and then other clubs had followed from it, and I had uh, supported them. And, uh, and with the passage of 215, I took responsibility for supervising implementation of medical marijuana in San Francisco, and that is that I would go to these clubs, they would, they would come to me, I would go to them, I would check out what was going on. I had been a supervisor for eight years, I knew the neighborhood people, I would go around the neighborhood and introduce them to the local merchants. I'd tell them what kind of problems that could be expected if somebody if I heard that they were, for example, in one area, people were getting uptight about parking because the club people having placards, mostly being handicapped people, they could, they could leave their car on the street all day and that would take parking away from the merchants. So we worked out, okay, we won't park there, we'll park farther where we take public transportation. We uh, worked out how, how it would be advertised. As district attorney, I took the position Anybody who robbed a medical marijuana facility was going to prison. Uh, no, no, Mr. Nice Guy on those because I knew that that was a kind of a vulnerable victim, and, and I'm happy to say the police followed that precedent and they took them seriously, and and they uh, people who robbed those outfits were arrested and and did go to prison in due time. And I, I, I did what I could to help medical marijuana and to keep it operating within the legal guidelines that 215 presented us. I then was appointed by the Attorney General to that committee of his that, that met, that ended up developing uh, some legislative amendments or additions to Proposition 215 on AB 240. And then uh, I guess as district attorney you could say that I kept the medical marijuana stuff well under control but worked out a good relationship. If, for example, somebody were arrested growing marijuana or transporting marijuana and they told the police that it was, that they were doing it as part of a medical marijuana operation. Uh, and I would get names and I would go and, and uh, check with the people who they said they sold it to and, and find out if that was true or not. And, and those people trusting me and, and operating in confidence would usually tell me, yeah, we don't know this guy, or yeah, that guy, and sells us marijuana on a regular basis at a lower than the market cost so that we can do our business and I would pursue the case accordingly, drop it if it was a medical marijuana case and if it wasn't then pursue it as a, somebody dealing, making money illegally. Well, would you like to say something about um, Supervisor Mercurini's new resolution passed, hasn't been signed off on yet, but yeah, well, um, Ross's legislation, to be honest, you know, Ross worked for me for years and years as a supervisor. He was an aide of mine. He worked as a, a DA investigator. He went to the police academy f at my behest. And, uh, and then I supported him for when he ran for district attorney. I, I had told him repeatedly I, to kind of stay away from it, that it was a dangerous area to get into trying to legislate something that's quasi-legal and quasi-illegal. He, uh, he insisted on doing it and he came up with a huge document uh, in the course of which had some negative impacts that would have closed about 17 clubs, including a number of them that had hired me to represent them. and. Uh, so we went, we went with, met with Ross, we got together our forces, we talked to the other supervisors, 
we were able to finally convince him to take out the provisions which were the most negative, one being that they that the people who were running these clubs had to keep careful records and make them available to uh, to public authorities. Needless to say, that was not a good idea. And with the federal government looking around, making their case for them. And, and secondly, he uh, had zoning requirements and distances from schools and stuff that would have the and result of closing close to half of the clubs. So we were able to convince him, one, to take out that uh, keep careful records thing, and two, to grandfather in the existing clubs, and then in 18 months they'll have the opportunity to go ahead and apply under somewhat different rules than everybody else had. So it ended up being uh, <coughs> being certainly acceptable and given the way all the other cities are reacting all with moratoriums with no clubs in our city and so on perhaps setting a good precedent for other places that uh, that uh, want to permit medical marijuana to exist without uh, worrying that it's going to have a negative effect on their town I preferred the uh, legislation that West Hollywood had passed, which was nice and short. And, uh, Ross's was, was more complex. One thing, Ross was trying to develop a, uh, a, a legislation that not only would permit the existing clubs to exist, but that would allow a way by which new clubs could come about. That made it much harder and, and, and more difficult. But he did that if, under lots of restrictions, and it won't be easy. And most of them will be in neighborhoods where, uh, you know, Hunters Point and some areas in South of Market and so on, where uh, industrial areas where a lot of people wouldn't go. But at least he got a foot in the door. <coughs> Excuse me. The war on drugs. Ninety years of failure. Talk about that. Well, I always felt, you know. I don't think people recognize what an impact drugs, the war on drugs has on our criminal justice system. About between 60 and 70 percent of the cases handled in San Francisco have to do with drugs. Ties up our courts, fills the jails, accomplishes little, because you're talking here about not a crime against somebody else which has a victim and and so how do you win it how do you lose it it uh, you would have thought we had learned the lesson during prohibition that that uh, that kind of legislation isn't going to work and it creates more side effect problems uh, than it solves that is to say the the uh, you know marijuana had or drugs have it hasn't had quite the impact of creating the uh, mafia and the criminal groups and that uh, prohibition did, but certainly it has uh, taken drugs from being uh, something people take for pleasure and, or uh, health reasons into being a, a criminal enterprise in which people have guns and people kill each other and and it has extremely sad results. You only have to look at this wave of murders that's going on in San Francisco and your heart just goes out for these kids and drugs are involved in a lot of that because for a lot of these young people that's the only way they're going to make any kind of money and they go ahead and they do it. I think the war on drugs is uh, is unwinnable but even but more than that, I think it's just wrong that that is not the right approach to the drug problem. That is to say that it, it's a medical issue. It's a personal and a medical and a psychological issue and it should be treated that way. And if we could take these, this whole field of drugs out of law enforcement, think what we could do to violent criminals. Think what kind, if, we, if police 
and courts and judges were freed up from 60, 70 percent of the responsibilities they had that they could devote to a lock you finding, arresting, and locking up violent criminals, which a safer society uh, we would have. It's, uh, it's, to my mind, just a sadness that we do waste so many resources on drugs. And one of the things I did as district attorney was to try to make a clear distinction between violent crimes and nonviolent crimes. And nonviolent crimes, we're basically talking about drugs, as I say here in San Francisco, 60 to 70 percent of the crimes, very little of that having anything to do with assaults on people or robberies or drugs or violence, although there's <coughs> some of it as a spin-off from the illegal character and the easy money of it. But I, uh, so, so what I would do would be to try to treat the two of them differently. I gave people who had drug cases a break. I gave them a second chance. I gave them a third chance. I gave them a fourth chance. Because I know that, they, that this, people who have drug problems, and it is true by the time you reach the criminal justice system, drugs have become a problem to you. I mean, there's an occasional something where somebody just, a police officer comes across drugs uh, just by accident and the person gets arrested. But usually you're talking about people who the drugs have come to control their life, that, uh, you know, they've gone into criminal activity as a result of it, that, that it has become a problem. So how do you cure that problem? Well, it's, to my mind, the way you cure it is you, you get the, either get the person off drugs or learn to, or help him learn how to control it so it's no longer a problem with it. So I would try to divert these drug cases into all kinds of programs. They, there weren't that many programs available on a state level, diversion and, and so on. So I just invented programs. I created new programs, uh, Streets to Work, uh, programs where people with, uh, young people with drug problems could uh, go to uh, get their GEDs or the high school diplomas or go to college for a couple years, get a job, become worthwhile citizens, quit, quit abusing drugs, and get the charges against them dropped. Uh, I developed numerous programs along that line. I ended up, of course, also being the only district attorney in the state who supported Proposition 36 and doing everything I could to see that was implemented and carried out. And San Francisco has got lots of good programs designed for people who drugs have come to control their lives and led their lives in a negative direction. And not just people who possess drugs, but people who possess for sale or even minor league sales and so on as well, I fit into that category. Then, given that, then the other side of the coin is be tough on violent crime. I compare, for example, the way I handled homic handle homicides to the way the present district attorney's office handles homicide. Hey, if you killed somebody in San Francisco when I was DA and you were arrested, you were going to jail and you were going to be in jail for a long time until that case got to trial. And if you got convicted, you were probably going to be gone for the rest of your life. You weren't going to go to jail and be back in the community in a few days or be back in the community in a few years. If you committed murder, if you committed a violent crime and murder being the key one, then, in, uh, then you, I was tough on that. And I thought that distinction paid, you know. I, I can't say, I mean, timing is a lot of different things, but certainly the fact that we've got a murder rate now twice what it was when I was following those policies, to my mind, you have to say, well, maybe it has something to do with that. Maybe not wasting your energy on drugs and using your resources to get violent crimes and making it clear to people, hey, if you kill somebody in San Francisco, goodbye. That community is not going to see you anymore. You're going to go to jail, you're not going to get bail, you're going to stay in jail for two years, three years, whatever it takes us to get you to trial, and if we get you convicted, you're going away for a long, long time. I think that's a, the kind of policy that's a good policy to have a little minute. On the other hand, 
to have a policy. If you've got a drug problem, if drugs are controlling your life, if drugs are leading you in a wrong direction, I like to give you a good kick in the butt and get you straightened out and get you back in school and get you reunited with your wife and your kids and and becoming a positive person again. Could, could you say something about what it's like to defend in a drug case? Uh, the, the feds, they're a lot harsher than the state of California, but even the state here. Right. I mean, what, you know, what is there to say about it? The uh, defending a case in federal court, a drug case, is, is tough. They don't believe in medical marijuana. They don't accept that, although they can't completely duck it, and, and it makes them nervous, too, you know? Uh, and the judges certainly are aware of what's going on and, you know, I mean, fortunately there's still a lot of people in the criminal justice system who believe that the punishment should fit the crime and, and they're not going to put somebody away for 20 years for possessing marijuana or something. Uh, so it has an impact in that area, but it's tough. They're tough cases to defend and the punishments are unbelievable. Mandatory minimums. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years uh, for possession of, uh, of drugs. Uh, filling up our prisons, the federal prisons like the state prisons are full of drug offenders, uh, wasting all our resources uh, pursuing that and not pursuing violent crime. S same problem maybe even a little more because the federal justice system, of course, is not as fair as the state system is. They, have, they don't draw juries right from this the venue. They're drawn from a much larger area. They're more conservative, more white juries. The, the law is, is passed by a Southern-dominated Congress and is really are always just terrible was the punishments are unbelievable, so out of proportion to uh, to the offenses involved. In in, con in conflicts over drug law, over marijuana law between the, the the state and the federal government, is the state attorney general legally obligated to take up the defense of California citizens who are being persecuted by the federal government? From Not individual cases. There are public defender's offices to do that, and there's a state defender's office to, for appeals. Uh, but the district attorney, or the attorney general of California, and, and the district attorneys, in my opinion, and, and in practice, uh, are obligated to defend our system are obligated to go to bat for Proposition 215 and to make it clear to the federal government that, hey, you got your law, and as the Supreme Court recently pointed out, their law is supreme to our law when the two come in conflict with each other. But as far as California law enforcement officials go, we are guided by Proposition 215. I've found that police are coming around on it, and that here in San Francisco, the police are very good about it that they arrest somebody for marijuana, they say you've got a doctor's uh, recommendation, and if they can show a card, they can go. In, in your case law, uh, 60 or 70 percent were drug cases. How, what percentage of those were marijuana cases? Well, of course, now we have the $100 fine for marijuana possession. So the... Uh, 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 a minority of those cases were marijuana cases. The, there would be marijuana sales cases. There would be marijuana possession for cases and transportation. Uh, but ordinarily the marijuana possession cases, if somebody was arrested for possession of marijuana, they'd end up with a $100, and I think in San Francisco it was $78 a fine that they actually were charged and a, and a misdemeanor. Uh, and of course, all expungements and uh, sealing of cases and dismissals of cases and all those kind of things are much easier to get with marijuana than uh, than really anything else. So on a state level, uh, w 
we were pretty good about the marijuana. Now, when the, then when you get up to the medical marijuana level, you begin to get much more complicated issues. In other words, when somebody just has a, a marijuana cigarette and the, and the police find it, they're going to give them a slap on the wrist and a small fine. That's not a big deal. <coughs> they are pretty supportive, or they they at least publicly go along with the medical marijuana, and they don't bother the medical marijuana clubs, and they're pretty good about responding to complaints and, and enforcing uh, the law on robberies and so on. But that but the it, the weak area, of course, is how do the clubs get the marijuana? And that's where you really it takes an initiative by a district attorney to say, look, if if they're growing it or have it in their possession to supply it to a medical marijuana club and I can verify that in my opinion that's within Proposition 215 and I won't prosecute those cases and we didn't prosecute those cases including in some cases large grows. We were in Santa Cruz recently talked to Mike Rotkin the mayor they they passed a resolution they're going to open their own store as soon yeah. as the feds get off their back. Do you think that would be a good policy for San Francisco? Well, uh, you know, San Francisco voters, by a pretty substantial margin, passed legislation saying that we should do grow, that we should do what we can. I, you know, maybe I'm a, a little overcautious, but hey, you're a lawyer. Uh, I, I don't want to take the feds on directly. I don't mind taking them on indirectly and finding ways to get around them. And, and, uh, but for example, I feel that if the city of San Francisco started growing marijuana, that the federal government couldn't tolerate that. That it would have repercussions that somebody would get arrested, that, they would, that something would happen as a result of it. Now, how do you live within that? Well, as I said, my way of, de of dealing with that was if, if a grow what could convince me it was a grow for a medical marijuana, I'm fine. I wouldn't, I wouldn't prosecute those people. If the marijuana w was going and I could speak to enough people to be convinced it was legitimate that the marijuana the person was arrested with was on its way to a medical marijuana club, fine. I wouldn't prosecute that case. I think some DA, DAs are beginning to lean in that direction just because of the reality and the courts and the leg, legislature and Prop 4, you know, the, and it's AB 420 open it up a little bit. Courts have said, well, transportation, if it's medical marijuana, that's okay. We're kind of opening a little bit in it. But the problem you had is that even where Proposition 215 provided for legal use of marijuana and, and supplying of marijuana to people with the doctor's recommendation and that the people who were doing it were entitled to make a fair return for their efforts, that still doesn't cover the whole area of, of where the marijuana is coming from. And most of it has to be obtained from, from the black market. It's something else before we finish up here that I, I would like to hear what you have to say to the people out here are going to watch this all over the country. Not every place has a Dennis Perone or a Terrence Hamlin. How, how do you change the law in Kansas or Alabama? Or, well, some advice. Yeah, well, it's like any other law. You just have to keep plugging away at it. You have to. I mean, I'm amazed that it has never become a political cause the way it should be. I mean, here you have a city like San Francisco where 80% of the people have voted for uh, to legalize medical marijuana, yet that doesn't become a big campaign issue. You don't hear, oh, somebody's for it or somebody's against it. it in moderation, it is. In other towns, there's other places where the majority of people, I mean, the whole state of California, 58% of the people voted for Proposition 250. Why aren't politicians and law enforcement officials in other counties 
and in other legislative districts speaking out stronger than they are for medical marijuana. It still has a an old-fashioned backward taint. Oh, it's drugs. Oh, it's drug dealers. Oh, it's people not appreciating what marijuana really is and the potential and, and the fact that marijuana, I mean, you know, I, 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 in, as, in eight years as a Board of Supervisors member, in eight years as the District Attorney, I saw so many examples that to my mind there is no question that for some people marijuana is an extremely valuable medicine that lessens their pain and suffering and makes them able to pursue a normal life they are unable to do without it. It is a medicine and it should be treated that way. And in my opinion, we should all be more outspoken about it. The outspoken ones are basically the law enforcement people who have who are still living in the era era of uh, when marijuana was considered a, a killer drug. Reefer Madness. Yeah, Reefer Madness. Reefer exactly. Madness. How, well, how, have you been, how has your position on this been taken by other DAs around? Like, well, like, what, what would the LA DA say? I, 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 San Diego. <laughs> I, I remember the first, the first time after it passed that I went to a district attorney's association meeting and that this district attorney from, from Sacramento, this woman, her name brought up hey you know I'm I'm really worried a little, uh, about this proposition 215 and, and what the consequences of it are going to be so I go oh hey don't worry about it look just here's how you do it just get a hold of your health department bring your health department and explain how we did in San Francisco when I got through she goes no Mr. DA that's not what I meant I mean, how can I keep them out of my county? <laughs> and so then all the other DAs chime in. Oh, you, 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 oh yeah, well what we do in our county is, if they say it's medical marijuana, we have a cell phone, we say, okay, phone your doctor right now. And if that doctor won't confirm it, we arrest the person and, and we charge them with lying to a police officer. Uh, well, things have changed a lot since then. I kind of like to think I had something to do with it, and the voters had something to do with it, and reality did. Uh, and now the and now the DAs, when I go to a DAs conference, or when I used to go to DAs conference, by the end of my second term, there wasn't the same hostility at all. People accepted that's the law. That's what we're going to have to live with. How do we do it? You know, they the the edges. You, the, the, like the how do you get it, where do you supply it, how does it come to you, that, that's an area where if a person wants to be tough they can still be an old belligerent DA or n n you know more flexible people can uh, begin to adjust it and I find more and more DAs taking a look at the whole thing and saying well hey this is on its way to medical marijuana and now I do, now that I'm in private practice I do a lot of medical marijuana cases, and there is a completely different attitude towards it than the last time I practiced criminal defense law 20 years ago. 